What's up, guys? Welcome back to the MMA meeting. Let's talk at the Weasel Podcast, where we talk all things MMA. So that fight night wrapped up, and man, it's just not looking good for these Apex cards. It feels like the Apex cards are just a big prelim. The fight nights years ago were so much better. Better quality, better fighters, better fights usually. They are stacking the pay-per-view cards, so there is like this roller coaster in terms of card quality. But fight night cards are going to be worse when you stack pay-per-views as much as they have. And I honestly don't know which I prefer. Do I like the old model where the pay-per-view cards weren't generally as stacked, so the finite cards would be better, right? You'll have more consistency with good quality. Or do you like it better where the pay-per-view cards are super stacked, but take away from the fight night cards. The one that had good name value and was kind of exciting to watch was the Roy Val and Moreno card. You also had Yair Rodriguez and Brian Ortega and a bunch of really good Mexican prospects. But we just got this Rolls Namajunas card and man, it did not play out too well. There were a couple good fights like Edmund Shabazian's comeback. Yusuf Zalal running right through Billy Corteo the way he did was extremely shocking. It looks like Zalal has definitely improved, but Corteo, I don't know what happened to him. He even said that he has to do some soul searching as he might be losing motivation in the sport. I don't know what it is. I know he's trying to do other things outside of it, but that was definitely not a good performance from him. Fernando Badilla also looked really good in his fight, but the best performance of the entire card, in my opinion, was by a long shot, Peyton Talbot, if you actually know a a little bit about both Simon and Talbot. Very interesting characters, especially Talbot outside of the octagon. Let's just say that, oh man, I literally saw a video on my Twitter feed, Peyton Talbot, this guy was upside down on the floor, vaping out of his butt. It's an old video, so he was probably like 20 years old. But people know what they're doing sharing that video. I didn't want to see all that. But when I'm on Twitter, I'm trying to just see some cool stuff, like fight sequences, something historical, like some battle that happened, or maybe even a little bit of anime. I don't want to see someone puffing smoke out of his ass, bro. Yo, 135 is a weird division. Great fighters, interesting personalities, probably the most athletic fighters in the UFC. Even their prospects are amazing. But man, it's a very zesty division. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just different, you know? I'll never get used to seeing that video. No more of that stuff. Please keep that to yourselves. Dude, the guy didn't even delete that video. He's proud of that moment. So at 135, we got Sean O'Malley, who dresses like a clown. And that's not an insult. It looks like he actually dresses like an actual clown. Let his wife sleep with other men, which is his thing. This is like, it's just weird, right? It's just weird. Talbot is vaping from his butt, wearing chokers and women's clothing. And we got Cameron Simon kissing his coaches on the mouth. 135 is a very, the new generation is very different. Oh, and I did see some people like confused as to why Cameron Simon and Drickus do kiss their coaches and stuff. It's a cultural thing. There are some people in South Africa that kiss each other in like some form of a greeting. But they only do it if you're friends with them or, you know, close to them and stuff like that. It's something they're kind of used to. In most areas of the world, that's a romantic thing. It's not a friendly thing. Would you guys be (laughs) friends? Drickus seems like a cool guy, but would you be friends with him if if it meant that he had to greet you that way? If you came to his house, you know, to watch the fights, knocking on the door, Drickus opens it. He's a little sweaty. He just got done working out. You come out with the handshake, right? You got the the bro handshake and Drickus leans in (laughs) and gives you a little smooch. How would you react? Would you go inside knowing that when you leave, you have to give him another one? Or would you just leave from there? You know, hey, I got somewhere else to be, man. And people have been talking about the tattoos on Talbot. You know, they're pretty distracting. The tattoos are references to anime, right? The dot on the torso is supposed to be from the anime Bleach. And there's one on his arm that's supposed to be from berserk so we got another weeb fighter and that's pretty awesome the whole represents being heartless emotionless like a void in oneself and talbot brings that into the cage watch when they give him cody garbrandt if cody loses the figgy and also the guy that got bit in the arm he got a tattoo of a bite mark there so he can relive that memory forever i don't know why he got it the fact that he gets it seems kind of cool but when you think about it like why would he get that tattoo does he want to be remembered as the guy who got bitten? Or is it just a funny story? You know, when he's older, he could tell his grandkids, yo, that one time this guy bit me in a fight, and I got the tattoo right here. And the last two fights, the co-main event and main event, were dreadful. Justin Taffa got wrestled very easily. He would throw knees even after hurting his opponent. It got taken down because of it. Quite low fight IQ, and the heavyweight fight that goes to a decision is almost always going to be very boring. And there wasn't even that much technique and skill to be excited by. And in the main event, Rose won the fight. It was a close one, but she didn't look too good. It looked like she spent a lot of time for this fight bulking. She looked way bigger than before, but also looked way slower than ever before and didn't have the pop in her punches. The snap was gone. She used to hit way harder when she was 
thinner. I think she's like overloading on the muscles and the tendons a bit too much where now all of her punches look a lot more labored and slow. She's probably physically stronger in the clinch, but even technically she looked like she declined a bit. The footwork wasn't the same anymore. She wasn't nearly as athletic and moving in and out with good entry shots and exiting shots, right? She had a really good right straight entry into a left hook exit immediately in sequence with each other. There were like no kicks. She started to slow down even though she trains in high elevation, but it's also because she added so much weight. And the corner advice from Pat Barry talking about, you know, playing with the pinkies and dribbling and stuff. He wanted to see Rose a point fight with Amanda Ribas. The feints are nice and stuff, but there's too much. Like there was so little commitment compared to the feints and touching and going. What's the point of all the added weight if you're just going to fight this way? You know, you would expect her to have a lot more commitment with power punches that Trevor Whitman would have definitely advised her to do. She needs Trevor Whitman more than Pat Barry in her corner. And there's truth to the saying that you don't bring family into business. Trevor Whitman is a better coach for her than Pat Barry is. Plain and simple, especially when we know about the game plan that he had for her when she fought Carla Esparza. And I don't know what's going on, why Whitman's not in her corner. I think she had some problem with him or something. You know, there was a rumor about that. But she needs him desperately in her corner. Because even when Pat Barry and Trevor Whitman were conflicting their corner advice to Rose, Trevor was always the correct one. He was always the one that was on point. Pat Barry was just saying stuff. It doesn't really make much sense. The only way Pat Barry is helping Rose in the corner is by emotional support. But the thing is, Rose has been fighting for a long time. You know, for someone who's been in the UFC ever since she was like in her early 20s, you know, started professional fighting, I think at 18 years old and fought the top fighters in the world multiple times. She was the champion twice, you know, defended her belt and stuff, went through wars with Joanna, got knocked out by Andrade, been up and down throughout her career, had some injuries along the way. At 32 years old, I'm not too surprised that Rose has declined because the earlier your rises, right, the earlier you hit your peak, because Rose hit her peak in like the mid to late 20s, the earlier your decline is going to be as well. Conor McGregor and Michael Chandler have been talking about fighting each other, so not really new since they were supposed to fight each other multiple times already, and I'm not going to believe it until they're both in the cage, but the headlines are that both Chandler and Conor are saying that they're going to fight each other in the summer. This could be anywhere from UFC 303 in June all the way to UFC 306 in September, which is probably going to be the sphere, the big Mexican show that I think they should have had Nate Diaz on there. You know, if, if it was going to be Conor McGregor, better to have him fight Nate Diaz at 306 than Michael Chan. That makes a lot more sense, right? And it was funny because when they told Dana about that fight for the sphere, he was like, we want a Mexican fighter. And then the reporter said, but Nate is Mexican. And Dana was like confused by it. He's like, whoa, really? Since when? But he still spilled cold water over that. And maybe we're going to get this Chandler and Connor fight finally at some point. Regardless of what we think about both fighters at their age, it's still one of the best fights you could put on the UFC, in my opinion. Connor and Chandler have never been part of a boring fight, unless you count Connor's fight with Max Holloway kind of boring, but he did get injured in it. And it was fun up until that point where he was taking the fight to the ground, and I doubt he would even have an opportunity to do that against Michael Chandler. And poor guy's been waiting for Connor for what it seems like years, man. He could have had multiple fights up to this point and make a bigger name for himself, but that red panty night is really enticing, you know? It changes your life if you know what you're doing, unless you're Donald Cerrone, who still stands by this day that he couldn't make more money. I really wonder what master manipulator convinced him of that. But Conor vs. Chandler is going to be sick if it happens. And Alex Perez talking about fighting a 301. It seems like Islam wants to fight at 302 against maybe Dustin Poirier since the other contenders are fighting each other at 300. And after that, it's going to be quite difficult on picking Tuttle fights outside of Tom Aspinall, right? He can fight somebody. And I think it should be Curtis Blades. It's looking like Jones might be able to fight by the end of the year, maybe the December card. Ilya Tapur should be ready to fight in August against Max Holloway, unless Max Holloway takes a horrible beating by Gaethje. If that's the case, then Ilya can even come back sooner against maybe Mavsar Evloev or Brian Ortega. And then by the end of the year, I would think early next year, he should fight Volkanovski. The thing I didn't get about Conor McGregor is, why didn't they just book him this whole time? You know, there were so many cards he could have been a part of. And it seems like he's ready. At least he was saying that, right? He was very eager to get back in the cage and they just didn't want him to do so. I think it's because they want to extend his contract, knowing that it's about to be up. But the thing about Conor is he's in a position where he doesn't need to extend his contract. He is wealthy. He doesn't need to do that. And I believe Dana said before that they have to offer fighters at least three fights a year. I don't know if that's an actual thing that they have to do, or that's just what they try to do sometimes. Because it's pretty clear at this point that fighters on Connor's level, and even just 
UFC champions in general, they could go to boxing and make much more money. Even not just the boxing sport, even other organizations in MMA like Demetrius Johnson making a lot more money in one championship. He even said recently that it's the best decision he's ever made in his entire career going over there. And from one Irish fighter to another, Ian Machado Gary has rejected the Michael Page fight where Michael Page and a lot of other people want this fight to happen, but Ian Gary said that the only thing that he's interested in right now is just to fight up. Anybody with a higher rank or the champion or whoever it is, if it propels him upward, that's the fight that he's going to take. And Michael Page is ranked below him, so he's not even looking at Page right now, which I guess is understandable for someone who wants to make his way to a title fight, but I think Ian Gary's misunderstanding on where Michael Page is really at, even though his ranking is lower than his, Page can get to a title fight pretty quickly especially considering his age, and if he's given certain matchups, which they did say. They said that they want to match up Michael Page specifically a certain way to make, you know, fun fights, exciting fights for the fans and all that stuff. And I'm all on board with that. You know, if they can get him to fight, I would love to see the Wonder Boy fight for sure. If they could fight Jeff Neal, if he could fight Vicente Luque, Ian Gary would have been a good one stylistically. The strikers of the welterweight division is perfect to go up against Michael Venom Page. You know, in a few wins there, he's going to make his way to a title fight. He's too big of a name to just sit around in the top 15, lower end of the top 10. That's definitely not where they want Michael Page. They want him higher up against the better fighters of the weight class so that they could build better fights for different fight cards. And Ian Gary has to really be careful what he says here because if Michael Page does in fact pass him up, if by some way he manages to become the champion or the number one contender, Michael Page might do the same thing against him. You know, he might give him the same kind of treatment. Nah, you rejected me before. I'm not interested in giving you a title fight or, you know, something of that nature. Kind of similar to what happened with Tom Aspinall and Cyril Ghosn. Tom Aspinall is doing the same thing, whereas Cyril Ghosn rejected him in the past. Now that Tom Aspinall is the champion, he doesn't want to give Cyril Ghosn that title fight now until he's absolutely earned it. And I think the Ian Gary and Michael Page fight is really good. That would be so fun to watch. Two guys around the same height, both strikers. Page is going to have a major reach advantage. Michael Page comes from a traditional karate background, whereas Ian Gary comes from a boxing background. That would be a pretty cool fight, but I think Ian Gary wants his Colby Covington fight instead, and I do agree with that. I think Michael Page should fight Jeff Neal or Gilbert Burns, and Ian Gary should fight Colby Covington. And then maybe after that, you know, they could fight each other. Because if MVP beats Burns, he'd be pretty close in the top five. You know, he'd be like number seven or number six. If Ian Gary beats Colby Covington, he'll be in the top five, maybe number four. Jack Dahl is going to fight Shafkot most likely. It looks like that fight seems to be brewing up. And then, you know, number six MVP versus the number four Ian Gary. Winner fights Kamar Usman or something, you know, and then that would be the title fight afterward. Because I think Bilal fights Leon first, then the winner of Jack and Shafkot fights the winner of that. And in the meantime, the winner of Ian Gary and MVP should fight Usman. That's what I think should happen. But that's only if Ian Gary beats Colby and if MVP beats Burns. Because Burns is a very dangerous, or should I say, a difficult style for MVP to come across, right? The wrestling and the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is going to be tough. You know, on the feet, Gilbert Burns doesn't have too much for MVP, in my opinion. He has some good leg kicks he can land and stuff like that. But older age, off-the-shoulder surgery, his striking didn't look great against Jack. He's at such a reach disadvantage and height disadvantage while also probably being slower than MVP, which is crazy because Burns is a pretty fast welterweight. If Burns can't get that fight to the ground, he's going to run into a lot of problems in the stand-up. It might get knocked out because he doesn't have near the chin that Kevin Holland does. You know, the shots that MVP hit Holland with and, you know, the other fighters in Bellator, I don't think Burns takes those shots. He hits Burns with a spinning elbow or lunging in with the right hand to the jaw, it's over, you know, or even to the temple because of the shorter stature, it'd be over for Burns, I think. But if Burns can get the fight to the ground, it can go his way as well. So it's a very interesting stylistic matchup, I think. Then the fight between Gary and Michael Page, I think is one of the better striking matches you can have in the welterweight division. Both guys are dynamic. They're very fast. They're snipers. Page will cause those kind of collisions that would force Gary to exchange with him in small bursting moments. You know, not like long drawn out combinations. And you know what's funny about that? Even though as much as people want to clown on Ian Gary for all the stuff outside the cage, the guy's a really good striker and he might in fact beat Michael Page. Maybe. He has really good fundamentals. He has great leg kicks. He has a really good jab he can work with that can intercept Michael Page's blitz. And he's really patient as well. He definitely showed that against Jeff Neal. But if Michael Page were to knock out Ian Gary in spectacular fashion, I mean, he would blow up as a star. He'd be one of the bigger names in the welterweight division, especially with the way that they're promoting him. I mean, they're giving him a lot of limelight right now. And if that carries on into, let's say, a Gilbert Burns win and then an Ian Gary win, 
All I'm going to say, if he fights Leon Edwards after that, or Kamar Usman in a number one contender fight, that's going to be a really big fight, man. And it's kind of funny because, you know, before he came into the UFC, there were a lot of people that were very doubtful on his skills. Like, they thought this guy was going to get torched out here. And it just goes into the whole illusion that, you know, Bellator fighters are just so much worse than UFC fighters, which is generally true. But the top guys at Bellator can definitely hang with some of the better guys in the UFC. That has been shown routinely. I mean, Eddie Alvarez became the lightweight champion. Michael Chandler made all the best lightweights fight for their lives against him. Some of the best lightweights we've ever seen in the sport from Charles Oliveira to Justin Gaethje, to Dustin Poirier, poor Dan Hooker, that guy got killed out there. At the end of the day, it's ultimately just a fight between styles, right? And if you can understand the styles, you can kind of determine how a fight can possibly go, depending on how a fighter approaches it, you know? And the way that Michael Page usually fights, there are definitely some top 10, top 15 welterweights that he can beat. There's definitely some he can lose to badly as well. But to count this guy out and doubt his skills just because he was in Bellator is a foolish mistake. Definitely for Michael Page's opponents, they cannot underestimate this guy. Because there were some fighters saying the same thing, that he would get beat once he comes to the UFC. And now they're in a bit of a root of awakening, at least some of them. You know, because if he fights like Sean Brady, <laughs> that's going to be a tough fight for him stylistically. Or any other wrestler. And speaking of welterweights, did you guys hear about the fighters that got removed or released? Brian Barbarina who was a welterweight for most of his career, he just went up to middleweight for his last two fights, he got released by the UFC off a four-loss streak, three of those by submission. And before that loss streak, he was on a three-fight win streak against older fighters, Robbie Lawler, Matt Brown, and before that, he'd be Darian Weeks, right? And he never quite made it to the top 15, if I remember correctly. And the first time he made a name for himself at all was beating Sage Northcutt in his third UFC fight. You know, he beat him by submission in the second round. And ever since that, the hardcore fans have been familiar with Brian Barbarino, even though he never made his way, I think, in the top 15 and definitely not in the top 10. And most of the best guys that he beat were older. Again, Lawler, Brown, Jake Ellenberger. He did beat Warley Alves, which was pretty good back in the day. But he seemed to have been a springboard or a stepping stone for the best fighters in the welterweight division, the actual best fighters. Losing to Colby Covington back in 2016, losing to Leon Edwards back in 2017, Vicente Luque in 2019, which was a war, man, such a great fight. He came so close, man, to beating Luque. And that was Luque before the decline, before Jeff Neal bashed his brain into pieces. Then he lost to Randy Brown, you know, later lost to Hava Dos Anjos, and then, you know, that started the, the law streak at the end of his career. And he never was like, I would say anything spectacular when it comes to technique and stuff, but he was a brawler, man. Back then, the fight with Vicente Luque is always going to be the vivid memory of Brian Barberino for me. I think it was the highlight of his career, even over the Sage Northcutt win, over him knocking out Jake Ellenberger and, you know, TKOing Robbie Lawler. I think the Vicente Luque loss was the highlight of his career. The other fighter that got released was Felipe Linz, which was very interesting. Felipe Linz is the opposite of Brian Barberino. He's coming off a four-fight win streak ever since returning back to the light heavyweight division, right? Defeating Marcin Procnio, OSP, who just defeated Kenny Neschukwu in a huge upset, beat Maxime Grishin, and just beat Ian Kutilaba. He may have fought off his contract, though. That might have been the thing because I wouldn't understand at all why someone would get released for going on a four fight win streak. And the thing about Felipe Lenz is he came from the PFL after Bellator. And I think he might go back if he doesn't renegotiate with the UFC. And he's probably gonna make a lot more money in the PFL. And that seems to be the thing after the whole settlement now between the fighters and the UFC. So from one fighter in Conor McGregor's career to another, we talk about Diego Sanchez, who was a guy that Conor called out before and still to this day goes on to be one of the weirdest callouts in UFC history. Diego Sanchez is still talking about his relationship with the GOAT, the master of the school of awareness, the man that knows the secrets of all fighting, Joshua Fabia. So Diego is still having problems with this guy, right? Because apparently like Joshua Fabia is still talking to him. He's manipulating him, blackmailing him, all this stuff. It's a really sad story if it is true. He called him a unstable, mentally unstable, sociopathic psychopath, in his words, a Charles Manson type of mind. And here's the thing, dude. We all warned Diego Sanchez. The whole MMA community, from the fans to the fighters, all told Diego Sanchez, do not trust this guy. It was as clear as Joe Rogan's head how shady this Joshua Fabia guy was. I mean, he was hanging you upside down, punching you in the head. You don't think that's kind of weird? And the thing is, Diego's also kind of you know, confused a lot of times and tries these different ways of training and welcomes different people into his life to teach him certain things. I think he goes a little too deep into this like nomadic 
yoga kind of lifestyle, you know, and then he welcomes these different people that he thinks can teach him something new. It's good to be open minded, but not welcome everything into your life, you know, not welcome everything into your teachings into your craft. If you just accept all information told to you, you are open minded, but you're also a sheep. Here's exactly what Diego Sanchez said about Joshua Fabia recently, quote, I'm dealing with a very unstable, mentally unstable, sociopathic psychopath that is basically the best way I can put it. You're dealing with a Charles Manson type of mind where he's so far gone that it makes him unstable and dangerous. And the manipulation that was put on, part of it was that he's like an ex-trained hitman, an ex-contract worker for the cartels. And just so much darkness on this guy that it put me in the state of fear that I was worried for the safety of not only my life, but also my daughter, my mother, and even my daughter's mother too. What? Oh, his baby mama. Okay. And Diego also started talking about how Joshua Fabia believed that Diego Sanchez was the one that ruined his company and so he's doing it back to him. So it seems to be kind of like this back and forth between this manipulative guy and a very gullible person in Diego Sanchez. And Diego says that he wants to stand up to this guy now, you know, confront him or whatever he's got to do in order to handle Joshua Fabia. Diego Sanchez should just tell his friend John Jones that Joshua Fabia stole his coke or something. Jones will be flying out of that garage with a shotgun. So from one delusion to the next, now we talk about Chito Vera. And he is still talking about the whole grease gate. Right? He's saying that Sean O'Malley greased his hair before the fight. And because that his head was so slippery that he couldn't clinch up with him or grab him. And specifically, the only time that I saw him reference anything about clinching with Sean O'Malley is at the end of the fight, literally one second left of the fifth round, after he lands the body shot and curls Sean O'Malley over a beautiful liver punch. He goes to grab onto O'Malley's head and knee him, right? He tries to pull him into the knee with one second left of the fight. And he says from there that his hand slipped and maybe would have cost him something. He doesn't know what would have happened. You know, he didn't say that he would have won, right? He doesn't say that he lost because of the grease, but he's mentioning that it was there. So I do think he absolutely believes that the greasy hair ruined his chances potentially of winning the fight or at least hurting him in some kind of way. You know, maybe having a Nate Diaz moment against Leon Edwards where he lost the fight, you know, majority of the rounds, but he had the biggest moment of the fight hurting Sean O'Malley with the knee after the body shot. But here's the thing, they were fighting for five rounds and sweating with a lot of body fluids all over the place. It's going to make O'Malley slippery, greasy or not. And the reason why Cheeto believes that it was grease applied in his hair and not, you know, the sweat and stuff is because when they wiped his face, he was still shiny. He said his face is still shiny like he had Vaseline on it. And he believes that was like the grease from his hair going into his face or whatever it is. Because where else would that shine come from? This has to be one of the weirdest excuses after a fight, right? This is like after the whole Paulo Costa thing, where Paulo Costa said that he was drunk because of the night prior drinking wine. Or, you know, Tito Ortiz saying that his skull was fractured going into a fight. Cheeto's gotta let this one go. You know, he lost to O'Malley and that's it. They're technically one and one, but O'Malley definitely showed to be the better fighter of the two. And Cheeto has to fight his way back. And I think that fight with Peter Jan is the one to make, but Jan is injured. So that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. He had a ruptured ACL, a torn meniscus and a groin injury as he beat Song Yadong, which is crazy. And I believe he just got surgery for this stuff too. So he's not going to be ready to fight Chito Vera anytime soon, I think. But here's the other part. Chito did, I was going to say Chito took a lot of damage, but then in the interview with, with Ariel, I forgot this guy's Wolverine. It looks like he never even fought. There's no damage on his face at all. Do you guys remember the picture of his face that was going around of how much damage was there? I mean, he was cut open, bruised up, looked like a broken nose, everything. Over a week later, not even a blemish on his face. So I guess Cheeto is ready to go. But unfortunately, Peter Jan has a lot of surgeries that he's going to have to recover from. And maybe Cheeto waits for him because it is the perfect fight to make. So from this delusion, we're going to go to the next one. The fighters that settled for $335 million. Sometimes people ask me, Weasel, why don't you ever talk about fighter pay anymore? You used to talk about it years ago. I've said it before, and this is another example on the pile as to why I don't talk about fighter pay anymore. The fighters just always shoot themselves in the foot. It's There's no point even talking about it. We can complain all we want. You know, we can take the fighters' sides and try to support them all we can. But when they don't want to help themselves... There's nothing you can do. I think it's just a waste of time at that point to even entertain it anymore. It is what it is for these fighters. You know, some guys might be going to other organizations because of this or maybe go and cross over to boxing, whatever they're going to do. At this point, in my opinion, it's too frustrating to even talk about. 
And with that, let's go right to the questions. And we're going to start with Dope Slicer. Hey, Weasel, been a huge fan since 2018 and appreciate your content to this day. I was listening to one of your podcasts the other day and strongly disagree with one of your points regarding scoring criteria. You were talking about how attaining advantageous positions need to be factored in effective grappling when scoring a fight. I don't think this is necessarily the case as you don't score advantageous positions in striking, but rather the effective strikes themselves. For an example, if a fighter evades a strike, cuts the angle, line up the counter of his own, he doesn't score based off the position and the angle he attained, but the damage that he inflicts. I feel grappling ought to work the same way where you can attain the position but what scores is either the damage or the finish you impose. The only way I feel attaining a position actually scores is where it negates the opponent's offense for the entire round. Interesting. Really good question here, uh, or disagreement. The difference is going to be that striking and grappling are inherently different, right? When you're grappling, you're not really inflicting damage unless you're punching them, which is going to count for striking, or if you're getting them some kind of submission. The difference is also being that strikes happen a lot more frequently in the stand-up, whereas submissions on the ground are a lot more scarce. You know, it doesn't happen as often, right? You can't go for 30, 40 different submission attempts on the ground, and then it'd be equal to the strikes in the stand-up. Unless if we do it that way, you know, because we could score it this way. We could score where it's the submissions and the big takedowns that are the main things that are be counted for effective grappling. But that in that kind of scoring system, you would have to weigh that more than a lot of the strikes in order to kind of equal out the effect of grappling and striking. Because if you don't do it that way, then they will never be equal. It'll be effective striking is always going to have the supremacy above all the rest. So I think the reason as to why they do have the grappling you know, positions factored in into effective grappling is because, number one, they do take it from the other grappling sports as Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, wrestling, and all this sort of stuff also factors in uh, positions and also find a way to kind of equal out the striking and grappling here. But here's the other thing. If we're talking about the positions and the striking, I also do think if you get good positions like, you know, cutting off angles and kind of manipulating your opponent's position, that could also score for, you know, maybe octagon control or, you know, if they add that in there. And I don't know if boxing does this, but I wonder if they do score positions in the striking. So yeah, I can absolutely see it your way where everything just like whatever is contributing to a finish should be the thing that gets scored. So damage in the striking, big takedowns like slams and stuff, as well as submissions being scored for effective striking and grappling. But you would have to find a way to kind of equal those out at the end of the day if you want them to be equal. Unless you want striking to be ahead of grappling, you're going to change the whole dynamic of the sport in that way, which, you know, for a lot of fans, they would actually be happy about that. There are a lot of fans that would rather see the striking than the grappling or, you know, have the grappling as like an afterthought or a second phase of the sport rather than them being equaled out. So really good disagreement. Then we're going to Troy Hartung. Why do you think Hamza slowed down on the amount of fights he takes now compared to a few years ago? Do you think it has something to do with the visa issues or is there something more to it? I don't know much about the visa problems that he's having, but I also did hear something about, again, I don't know how much of this is true, but the whole thing about Kadyrov and whatever is happening over there. I didn't really look into it, but I did see people tell me that this seems to be a problem for Hamza right now as to why he's not fighting as often. Other than that, I don't know what else is there. I mean, he did fight Kamar Usman not that long ago. He fought Usman back in October, almost exactly five months ago. So he should be fighting right now like his next fight date should have been here in march if not in april right and the crazy thing is we don't even know who his next opponent is so he might not fight until the end of summer or even in the fall which is going to average him like one fight a year maybe a little bit more you know maybe 1.2 fights a year it's crazy because when he bursted onto the scene we all thought he was going to be the guy that fights every month pretty much i mean there was that time he fought twice week after week Going from that to a guy who fights once a year is crazy. He fights less than some champions. He did have problems before with like COVID and stuff, but yo, he should be getting going. You know, if he wants to keep that same kind of style of continuously fighting that made him a big star, he was like the evil Habib in a way. At least a lot of fans saw him that way. A guy who was willing to absolutely just dominate whoever's standing in front of him. Undefeated fighter, barely getting hit, fighting so often. It was like the grappling version of Mike Tyson in a way. When Mike was like destroying those early guys that did not belong in there with him before he fought the better boxers. Hamza also gets on the mic saying crazy stuff saying that he's going to kill everybody, run through everybody, no one's going to be on his level, and he was making it believable. People love that kind of energy, and they want to see more of it. Then we go to Mike Griffith. Based on that phenomenal performance MVP put up against Kevin Holland, the UFC might want to fast speed him to a title fight. How well do you think he does against the most boring guy on earth, Leon Edwards? We need to get Leon out of there, man. I understand he's a good guy, but we need excitement and we need entertainment. 
The guy has boring fights and a boring personality, Jesus Christ. And then how would Hamza versus Bo Nickel go? Who do you think wins and why? I can't really disagree with the Leon boring stuff because I've been saying for a while, Leon's always been kind of boring. He had that one kick that made people think differently and then we're back to the boar. Dude, even one of my brothers, he was loving Leon Edwards after he had kicked Kamaru Usman and he had the whole headshot thing and talking about where he comes from and stuff and he was really liking Leon, was a big fan. And then he fights Usman in not the most interesting or entertaining fight. And he's like, okay, you know, it's just a one-off. And I'm telling him, dude, Leon fights like this. He's a point fighter most of the time. There have been a lot of fights in his career where he's just done enough to win. You know, he's not really going for the knockout unless you really open yourself up for it. And then he fights Colby Covington. And now my brother doesn't really care about him as much anymore. A lot of people thought a very different thing about Leon Edwards after he had kicked Kamaru Usman. Like he was some kind of big knockout artist that was going to KO everybody he fights. And I'm like, bro, you guys haven't been watching Leon Edwards, have you? Every fighter's got some big knockout, but credit to Leon, nobody knocks out Usman, right? So that was a very special performance, a very special kick that he landed, but it's not a common thing. And Leon's personality, some people will say it's very boring. He doesn't really entertain the audience or entertain the media or give kind of like special kind of interview or something like that. So yeah, he's just Leon. Now, how do I think MVP, who's like the opposite of Leon Edwards in many ways? Actually, not really. He's had some boring fights too. But most of his fights, considering that he did fight a lot of cans, were very exciting to watch, which goes to tell you that so many people would even watch MVP knock out tomato cans after taxi drivers, after mailmen, over Leon, point fight his way to a decision against the best welterweights in the world. But do I think MVP would beat Leon? I don't think he wins, but he does have a chance whenever Leon derps right? When he has like this brain fart and throws some weird winging hook out of nowhere and that gets caught by that straight long punch from MVP sniping him and putting him down. I mean, that can happen. That can happen at any moment of their fight because he has like these very weird questionable moments where you're like, he just did that? Why did he just do that? Why did he throw a hook that wide? Why is he trying to take down Colby Covington? Not just once, but multiple times and putting himself in bad positions. He didn't learn from the last time he tried it. Why is he backing up so much right now when his opponent's not even giving him that much pressure? Why is he throwing an upward elbow at Brian Barbarino? Like, what is he doing here? Those kind of moments is where MVP can catch him. And honestly, if he gives those openings that he did against Nate Diaz, Barbarino, Colby Covington, etc., if he does that in front of MVP, he is in much more danger of getting finished. Because not only does MVP hit harder than all of those guys, not only is he bigger than all of those guys, but he's a lot sharper with his punches than all of those guys. So he's fast enough on the trigger to execute Leon Edwards for any of those openings that he gives him. But ultimately, I think Leon should win the fight without opening himself up like that. You know, he could take the fight to the ground. He could duck under and clinch up on MVP's blitz, trip him out from there, which he even succeeded against Kamar Usman. So he'll definitely succeed against MVP, who's not physically too strong. And that's where I think Leon is going to have the majority of his success is after tripping out MVP, landing big ground and pound shots, trying to get his back and choke him out. The moments, though, for MVP are there to win, though, stylistically. And as for Hamza versus Bo Nickel, right now Hamza beats him. He has way more experience. His boxing is well put together compared to Bo Nickel. And then we go to the worst box. Can we get another Dominic Cruz segment? Oh, no. Every morning I break my legs, and every afternoon I break my arms. So the story continues. He finally got that door open, and now it's time to go and brush his teeth so he can get ready for the day to commentate for the fight night. As he walks and drags that broken ankle into the bathroom. The bathroom's on the left. His neck cracks as he turns. Gotta turn left again. Crack. His toothbrush has been left in the sunlight with the window wide open. Oh no. He takes a deep breath to release some stress, collapsing his lung. With his one good hand, he reaches for the toothbrush. His hand burning in the sunlight. A gust of wind from behind throws his back out, planting his face over the sink. The phone starts ringing from the other room as more blood trickles down the ear and the Amazon delivery guy rings the doorbell. Pops Cruz's other eardrum. His dog starts barking in just pure agony from all the sound as he's stuck getting torched in the sunlight. Dominic Cruz could not come into work that day and had to be filled in by Paul Felder. I heard that's the story that always happens to him or something like this whenever he's not commentating. No, but some people actually thought I have something against Cruz when I said this the first time. No, it's just a joke. You know, back in the day, there used to always be jokes like this. Me and my friends used to talk to each other about, you know, how often Cruz gets injured. And word on the street is, these are the actual stories. No, I'm kidding. 
Now, just to give love to Cruz, man, I think he is like one of the greatest fighters, one of the best skilled fighters. He's so underrated as a bantamweight legend in terms of like what he would be able to do, even if he was in the UFC today. In his prime, that is, because he is still around. Then we go to AAG. How many rounds does it take for the GOAT, Steve Ursek, to put away Pantoja? That's an interesting fight, huh? The number 10 ranked flyweight going up against the flyweight champion. I honestly think Steve Ursek has a better chance against Pantoja than even some of the top five guys do. His boxing is pretty sound. He has good power. He understands angles better than most of the flyweights. He generates power very well from these angles as well. He has a competent enough of a grappling game where he might not get torched once it gets down there. But I do pick Pantoja to beat him because Pantoja's head is made out of an iron block and Urseg is still a flyweight so he might not be able to knock him out. If Davis and Figueredo could not knock this guy out with all the punches he landed on him flush, I don't think anybody does before Father Time takes it from him. Right, Father Time would take that chin away from Pantoja before anybody else does. Then we go to Vivid MMA. How does Shafka do against the current middleweights? Well, let's go through it really quickly. I think he beats Kyle Barallo. He beats Chris Curtis. Beats Paul Craig. Completely shuts down the takedowns. Anthony Hernandez would be a good fight. But right now, before Anthony gets better, I would pick Shafka. I think Hamza beats him. I think he beats Delize way too fast and just better in almost every area. Delize does have the, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu though. He's really good at that. He beats Jack Hermanson. I think he might lose to Imovov. Imovov is looking really good right now. Him and Paulo Costa could go back and forth, but because Costa doesn't deal well with jabs and straight punches in general, and he's quite obvious even with his own offense at times, he's getting better with the jab, but I think he will run to a lot of shots from Shafka, and Shafka would ultimately win that fight. Costa is a big guy though, man. That's the only thing. I think he beats Brendan Allen, beats Marvin Vittori. If he could take Kenanier to the ground, he would beat him, but Kenanier probably beats him in the striking, so it depends on how that goes. Shafka doesn't have the best means of taking the fight to the ground, and even against Jeff Neal, it was hard for him, you know? So because it was hard against Jeff Neal, I guess you can scale that somewhat to Kenanier, who's bigger and stronger than Jeff Neal is. I'm going to go with Kenanier against Shafkat. I got Whitaker against Shafkat. I got Adesanya against Shafkat. But if Adesanya gets taken down, he is absolutely toast. I got Shafkat against Strickland. And I also have Shafkat against Drikas, which might be a hot take. Then with the LTD, why do farts smell worse in the shower? It's because you don't wipe, brother. No, it's uh, you're in an enclosed space. And the smell has nowhere to go, right? The gas has nowhere to go and gets up all in your face, you know? You go to Kanye Best. In 2021, a 44-year-old retired chill son and well-off Ambien was able to take on one woman and five men on a six versus one fight. Yeah, I covered this. And chill won the altercation and was arrested by the Las Vegas PD. John Jones easily beat a 36-year-old chill minus toe amputation in round one. So realistically... How many people could a prime walk around weight John Jones take on? I'm guessing like at least seven to eight regular people. This is so funny because it's a real example. Chill actually on purpose became an example for us of how many civilians he can beat up at once. Now we have to mention, is this on an open basketball field or like a soccer field? Or is this like in a alleyway or something like that? Is Jones on his stuff? right? Does he got his substances with him, you know? Because if he's got the white powder with him and the syringe full of tea, I reckon he could take out Westland, Oregon, right? He beat the meanest guy of Westland, Oregon in one round with one toe amputated pretty much. What's the rest of the city going to do? And also, it's really going to come down to that. What country are we talking about? You know, where are you putting John Jones to fight these people? Because I think it's going to be a different result if he's going up against the civilians in North Korea versus if he's fighting the Russians that are living in Siberia and in those freezing conditions as well. And also what time period? Is he fighting now in modern society? Is he going up against the sea people in the Bronze Age? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't know. Maybe he could probably beat up like 10 people like normal civilians, maybe even more considering that all these guys cannot take a shot at all. Like a single calf kick from John Jones would put one guy out of commission an elbow to the eye puts that guy down. Judo tosses the other guy trying to run at him. Spinning heel kicks the girl behind him. Takes a whiff of his powder and then just thrusts his fingers into this guy's eyes. And starts headbutting the guy's car so he can't get away. No more exit strategy as John Jones puts his head right through the hood of the car. Busting the engine. Jones is like the best fighter walking on the earth. Then we go to Yoel Castro. Who do you think was most likely not juicy? Number one, Johnny Hendricks. Brock Lesnar. Hennem Barrao. Tiago Elvis. To put it into percentages, the higher the number, the more likely they didn't juice, right? Johnny Hendricks, like 5%. Brock Lesnar, like 2%. 
Henan Barrao like 15% and Tiago Elvis like 7%. So very unlikely for all of them. I would say it was probably Henan Barrao that didn't juice out of those four, but I don't even know about that. Johnny Hendricks' power and his size, like his whole body just morphed after USADA. He did have that one fight though. I believe it was against uh, Carl's Condit where his body was still looking the same and stuff, but his power completely disappeared. Where, where'd it go? And his strength started disappearing as well. And then soon after that, his body started to melt. Lesnar, I mean, he got caught for PDs, right? So Henan Barrow never popped. And I think it might've been more of him just getting beat down by uh, TJ Dillashaw that ruined his career over the whole USADA thing. But a lot of people did believe that he was on something. He was way too big as a bantamweight. He was so muscular at the time. He was powerful, fast, had great cardio. Nothing made sense about Henan Barrow back then. And he was also a very technical and skilled fighter. Tiago Elvis, his body literally changed and he went down a weight class. He actually tried lightweight, which would never have been thought possible back when he was fighting like GSP and Josh Koscheck back in the day. Dude, he was missing weight at 170. He missed weight twice. I believe it was against Matt Hughes and John, uh, John Fitch. And all of a sudden, a few years later, he's able to make 150 or at least attempted to make 155. He missed weight there too. But the fact that he even got down as close as he did to 155 is crazy for a guy that used to be as big as he was. Another guy you didn't mention was Eric Silva. What happened to that guy? After you saw that his whole body deflated. Not saying that he was on something. Not saying that any of these guys were on something. But their body definitely changed. We'll just say that. Then with the Kenzo Tenma. How does Poirier's resume compare to the other lightweight legends like uh, Charles Oliveira and Habib? I know Dustin has never won the undisputed belt. But the amount of top tier wins he has must put him into the lightweight GOAT conversation. Thoughts? Yeah, I think so as well. He's one of the few fighters that didn't need to win the undisputed title in order to put himself into the GOATs of a specific division. So the guys that he defeated from Max Holloway to Justin Gaethje to Eddie Alvarez, Conor McGregor twice, just defeated Benoit St. Denis, a guy rising up of the next generation. He beat Michael Chandler, Dan Hooker, Anthony Pettis. In my opinion, he's probably number three or number four greatest lightweight of all time. Maybe number five. He's in the top five. That's what I would say. Because you got Habib at number one, which is pretty much undisputed at this point. You got Charles Oliveira at number two, which I don't think is much of an argument against him at number two either. Number three might be Benson Henderson. But then you got Justin Gaethje and Dustin Poirier after that, in my opinion, right? You could put Justin over Dustin. Some people put Dustin over Justin. So I would say Dustin Poirier is in the top five of the lightweight division and also might be Justin Gaethje as well. Because who comes after that? You talk about Hava Dos Anjos, Tony Ferguson, Anthony Pettis, Frankie Edgar, BJ Penn. You have to start raking those guys. And would you put them above Dustin or Justin? Because I think the top three are pretty unanimous, I would say. Um, Benson might have some arguments against him, but I think most people order the top three of lightweight as Habib, Charles, Benson. And then with the Derek, is Mark Coleman a superhero? Can he put out fires with his ground and pound? You already know it. If he was in his prime, he would have walked through that house like it was nothing. Like it was just him tanning out in the sun. Mark Coleman used to be jacked, man. And actually, he's back in the gym. I don't know if you guys saw that. So he woke up after he uh, passed out from the burning house where he saved his parents. He went back in to get his dog. But unfortunately, and you know, sadly, his dog passed away. He went to the hospital. I don't know if he was in a coma, but he was definitely out for a while. He woke up, you know, happy he's alive, more happy that his parents were alive. And then soon enough, he's back in the gym, man. Which I don't know if that would be like a happy thing to see him in the gym again, because he's also been talking about competing again. And that's a sad thing. You know, a guy who's nearly 60 years old having a fight again is horrible. You know, and that's the whole thing we're talking about fighter pay and stuff. These guys should not be 60 years old and having to compete in this sport anymore or in boxing or anywhere else. We're going to go to Nick Beattie. Who's the better pocket fighter, Poirier or Tapuria? Who would be the top five best of all time? The better pocket boxer, I would say, is Tapuria. They do things quite differently, and Tapuria is rarely on the back foot in the pocket, where we, we did see Poirier on the back foot in the pocket, right? Usually when we see Tapuria in the pocket, it's him pressing forward. So we didn't see that too much out of him of how he deals with the pocket when someone's pressuring him back. And specifically what I like about Tapuria is the way that he uses his feet. His footwork is really good, cuts off the opponent very well, creates angles for his overhand and body shots. He has different targeting than Poirier does as well. And he doesn't drop his hands as often as Dustin does. He will drop his hand when he's throwing that left hook to the body or left shovel hook to the body as he drops his right hand. 
that is a big opening on him, but he generally has to keep everything a lot more textbook than Poirier from there. Whereas we've seen Poirier drop both hands as he's throwing punches, and sometimes even keeps his hands down. Tapuria doesn't also posture differently when they're in the pocket with someone. Tapuria is like naturally leading in, which always puts him in the position to cut off at a closer range, to intercept with hooks better, and also targeting the body and head naturally. And this lean-in posture also brings out the hooks and uppercuts of the opponent, and they're kind of playing Tapuria's game at that point. Where if you're throwing hooks at Tapuria, he's better than most of the guys doing it in this weight class. So it usually puts him in a advantageous position due to his posture when someone's standing taller or even leaning away while also stay while also being in the pocket it's going to draw out straighter punches from the opponent and they can even open up with more variety of shots like Dustin Poirier he stands taller than Poirier does when he's in the pocket and sometimes he will lean away for counters or take one rear step back not to say one's better than the other they both work in different instances but that seems to be a big difference between the two but Poirier at times will also completely evade the pocket and then re-enter again or sometimes because he is leaning in so close to them as soon as he backs away it creates like this like magnetic thing between him and his opponent like Josh Emmett did they try to hunt him down staying in the same range and he's able to shoulder roll them and all that stuff this kind of thing really works against fighters who are looking for explosive counter openings while even being on the back foot Right, so there's a big difference with the defense between the two fighters when they're offensively in the pocket against their opponent. But defensively, we've seen Poirier drop Michael Chandler, for an example, counter Conor McGregor with the hook and the jab. He's very good with that lead hand specifically. Whereas from Tapuria, we got to see more from him against the best fighters in the world while he's backed up in the pocket. And then with the Courageous Empire, thanks for the great contents. I've been asking this question for so many weeks now. Can you please make a video of all the nightmare matchups of each champion in their weight classes? Yeah, I'll eventually get to that. Um, I don't remember the last time I made one. I think I made it for the second half of 2023 or something. So probably in a couple months, I'll come up with the next nightmare matchup video. Unless you guys want individual nightmare matchups as their own videos. You know, so I could do one of like each champion. Depends how you guys want it. They're with the Spider-Man. Hey Weasel, love the channel. What's your favorite DBZ arc? Personally, my favorite was the Majin Buu arc, even though it did have the most fan service and arguably the Cell arc was the best in terms of like story writing and everything. And it was actually supposed to be the last arc. The Cell arc was supposed to be the end of Dragon Ball Z. And crazy, and it was actually crazy because in Japan, people started like rioting or protesting, wanting more from Dragon Ball Z. So that's why he made the Majin Buu arc. And it was the funnest one. I mean, the whole Majin Vegeta part was so crazy. Some of the best moments from the final atonement to the whole fight with Goku and stuff, the pride speech that he had, Kid Buu wiping out like the galaxy and stuff, Vegeta admitting that Goku is the best, Gohan going Super Saiyan 2 again at the tournament. I love the Majin Buu arc, man. The one I liked the least was the Frieza arc. Even though it's really good, I think, objectively, and that seems to be a lot of people's favorite arc. I don't know, I just didn't like the Frieza fight with Goku for some reason. I think it was way too long. But it definitely had its good moments. You know, the Ginyu Force was actually pretty menacing in the first place. After they got rid of Guldo, I was so annoyed for Kuhn when I was a kid. Do you guys remember when Frieza pulled off Nail's arm and Vegeta just terrorizing the Namekians? It was insane to see that. I'm actually kind of surprised they allowed that on, what was it, Cartoon Network when we were kids? They were good to dev. Why is everyone still underestimating Jamal Hill, even after he's proved to be one of the best in his division? I haven't seen people underestimating Jamal Hill, but if they are, I would guess people are saying that he beat an old Glover Teixeira, and out of his prime Thiago Santos post knee injuries, and he beat Johnny Walker, who's not an elite 205-er. So I can see people saying that about his competition, maybe, and in terms of his skills, I'm not gonna lie, I do favor Alex Pura to beat Jamal Hill, as long as Hill does not try to wrestle. If Hill tries to strike with this guy like he's saying he's going to, I can see him getting knocked out because he leaves himself much more open than Pereira does. Pereira's footwork is not really the greatest when he's moving back away from long punches that was shown in the Yuri fight and even in some moments against Adesanya. He has some trouble in the pocket with Bruno Silva at times. Crazy that Jamal Hill said that he thinks Bruno Silva beat Alex Pereira. He's really coming off delusional, like especially delusional in this Pereira fight. I don't like that mindset he's having. It, it looks like he's actually underestimating Jamal Hill a bit. I haven't heard too much of what Pereira said about Hill's skills, but I have heard what Hill said about Pereira. And man, it's not looking too great mentally on his side. It looks like he thinks it's going to be an easy fight in the striking against this guy. But hey, it is fighting, and if he pulls it off, kudos to him, because he would prove a lot of people wrong. I think technically speaking, what I see from the two, Jamal Hill is mostly a single-shot guy, 
throws one punch, one kick from distance, stuff like that. Doesn't have great defense. Usually attacking from long range and way overextends with his straights from there. Can definitely get countered by the left hook from Pereira. He stands pretty decent to where he might be able to turn his foot enough to check one of those calf kicks or even lift him up. As long as he doesn't widen his stance, but it depends on when he wants to do that. You know, there are times where he's standing a lot more straight up facing the opponent and that can allow him to start defending those leg kicks and counter when those miss. The main thing I'm worried about Pereira is if he is the one that pressures Jamal Hill back. It's the usual thing. Don't get too reckless. Hill will start cracking back and he could put Pereira down with a good shot. And just be mindful from the straights at long range from Hill. And that's pretty much it, I think. The high kick is going to be quite difficult to land on someone who stands so straight and tall like Pereira. And more often will keep his hands up and will counter with body punches. So if Jamal Hill's throwing up the right high kick, I can see where Alex counters that with the body jab. Or if Jamal Hill throws up the left high kick, I can see where Pereira counters him with a right straight to the body. Because with those motions, he's turning away from each of the kicks. And he likes to establish pressure off of these body punches. And Hill tends to leave his body open just by the way that he stands. And he's got that big belly to target. And that's ultimately the end of the episode, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Great questions. Really fun ones. And I'll see you guys in the next video.